This is the Game Changers Experience. Deep dive conversations with leading business disruptors, Olympic athletes, celebrities, entrepreneurs, and influencers from around the world. This show will teach you insights about the winning principles in mindset, productivity, marketing, branding, entrepreneurship, business strategy, and more. Hosted by Productivity Authority, business strategist, former elite athlete, author, and public speaker, Adam Strong. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the podcast today with myself, Adam Strong. And, uh, you know, it's really interesting. I haven't done one of these in a couple of weeks, uh, but really looking forward to today's session. Uh, I got my good friend T uh, Tara Halliday here. And, uh, you know, I've known Tara for a good few years, and we've kind of like, you know, I, I, you know, I'm a big believer in LinkedIn. And so me and Tara are always on LinkedIn. They're always supporting each other's posts. But, you know, you just... You just, you know, it, it's it's all about timing when it comes to collaboration and stuff. And this is just a classic episode of that. But who is Tara? And let me give you a brief introduction about today's episode. So Tara is a world-class imposter syndrome expert. Now, what she does is she loves to give advice to high-flying leaders uh, to eliminate that imposter syndrome and develop energy focus class. Clarity, resilience, and confidence, which is what we all need in life. Um, she's the author of uh, two best-selling books. Uh, one was released back in 2018, which was called Unmasking, The Coach's Guide to Imposter Syndrome. And she had a new book that came out this year called Outsmart Imposter Syndrome. So um, uh, I was going to say to you, so what are, what are some of the things that we're going to be covering, apart from the fact that we're going to be talking about imposter syndrome? Well, we're going to be talking a number of things. So we're going to be talking about Miscon misconceptions around, um, you know, what imposter syndrome is, of course, because it's very, sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish between what imposter syndrome is and what something else is. So we need to, to kind of distinguish what between the two is. Um, we're also going to be talking about where does, uh, how does imposter syndrome, how does it get manifested and how does it show up in professional environments and what is the impact it is going to have on you, if you suffer from imposter syndrome, whether it be on your career, whether it be on your, uh, whether it be running your business, whatever it might be, whatever the scenario, what's the impact there? We're going to be talking a little bit about that. We're also going to be, uh, Tara's going to be sharing some, obviously, some key strategies about how to overcome imposter syndrome. And uh, we're also going to be talking a little bit about what she does during coaching because she is a, a world class coach at overcoming imposter syndrome. So we're going to be talking a little bit about what she does during a typical coaching session um, and, uh, and you know, what she's looking for and how to kind of, well, I suppose, move things along and stuff. So uh, now, for you guys that are listening in, uh, if you're listening to us live, use the hashtag live. If you listen to us, uh, use the hashtag replay if you listen to the replay, of course. And if you're listening to this on the podcast, make sure that you go over and check all the show description notes out on the podcast. And do me a favor. If you love today's episode, please leave a one or a five star review. I will be super grateful for that. Um, as, as we're coming up to uh, the big 270, 270 episodes and stuff. So um, really thankful for your uh, appreciation for your uh, reviews and testimonials. Anyway, enough babbling from me. Tara, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Adam. I'm delighted to be here. Well, delight to have you. Delight to have you. It's been great. To, it's been great to uh, chat offline and, uh, you know, I suppose, rekindle our relationship, I suppose, in a way. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. It's Absolutely. Been, uh, been quite a few years. It has been quite a few yeah. years. Absolutely. Definitely. So, um, you know, I, I mean, today's we're going to be talking a lot about imposter syndrome, of course, because that's your area of expertise, isn't it? Yes. Um, but give us some context around that, because. I mean, when I when I generally speak to people that have an, an area of expertise like imposter syndrome, whether it be fear or whatever it might be, generally most people have got some sort of backstory uh, or some sort of context or whatever it is, uh, or some sort of life, I don't know, opening or, or eye-opening moment that kind of helped, you know, got you to where you are today. But tell us, do you have that, do you have that kind of like, eye-opening story and what was what's the what's the backstory behind this yeah uh, several light bulb moments i think is how i describe it so Very um good. i trained as a, a a holistic therapist and coach um 2000 right uh -huh. 2000 2005 
and I was working with people just with absolutely everything, you know, any kind of crisis difficulty they had, you know, we'd come, we'd have some sessions together and then they'd go off, you know, empowered and happier ideally. And that was great for some people, but some people kept coming back. And that, that really bothered me because I, I wasn't there to be, uh, to have them dependent on me. I wasn't there to be a crutch mm. for them. I was, you know, was supposed to be empower you and fly off, you know, all that. So I started looking into why. And I actually found out. So I found um, um, the core was a belief, right? The core was a belief. And it wasn't just a... Um, you know, people talk about negative self-beliefs and things like that, limiting beliefs. It wasn't just a, you know, one of several. It turns out that there's a root cause of human suffering, which mm. was discovered back in the 1950s mm. by Dr. Carl Rogers, the granddaddy of um, personal cent human centered um, psychology. Um, but at the time, they didn't know that you could do anything about it. So it was, mm. you know, dis disappointing. Uh, if, mm -hmm. if you didn't, if you didn't have, if you didn't learn not to have this belief, then you were stuck. And as adults, you were stuck. Changes in neuroscience came along, and uh, and, and now we learn there is neuroplasticity in the brain. We can change the way that we even these deep seated beliefs. So where I came to it from, I was looking for a solution for these dependent clients. Mm -hmm. I came across um, a, a teacher in the U.S. who dealt with the one belief is that the root cause of its suffering which is mm. that our belief that our worth depends on what we do our worth is conditional we do something good we are good we do something bad we are bad and that that's what carl rogers found and that's what this uh um, coach teacher in the u.s was so i trained in that and it was amazing i was having really great uh, interactions with my clients really amazing transformations in people's lives mm. One of them came to me and said, is this anything like imposter syndrome? This was back in 2016. And I, I thought, oh, I, I haven't heard of imposter syndrome. Let me go and research. I've got a background in science, engineering and research. So I was all over the research and academic papers. And um, I was astounded. This was the first light bulb moment that, there, that the symptoms of imposter syndrome are exactly the same as the symptoms of a belief. That your worth is conditional mm. that is that you the belief your worth is conditional is the root cause of imposter syndrome and i checked with my you know my my expert teacher and he said oh yes yes it's just a special case and i thought well you know it might be just a special case but you know the research here says that over 70 percent of high achievers experience this this is completely unnecessary suffering because mm. there's a solution to it what can what can we do and that's when i decided then to, i was going to specialize narrow things down to um deal with imposter syndrome mm. um, and then the the second light bulb moment because tangent to this i was went off and i was doing some brain training brain alpha wave development where you put electrodes on your head and you sit on a chamber and you you listen to the feedback from your brain as you do these exercises and that was a very powerful transformational experience for me so so much so i went through the program three times and then went to and, and spent three months in america training to run these um, neurofeedback sessions in specialist facility in german and america so um I was doing that and having great fun, but then I was connecting the dots again. Okay, this powerful transformation is actually indirectly changing the belief about your worth as conditional. So here we've got a very, very powerful, repeatable way to change your beliefs. So I put the two together. And that's where that's how I got. So these two light bulb moments and, and put them together. And so what I've ended up with is a very structured program doesn't need the electrodes on your head i tested that um very structured program that we change the belief that your worth is conditional to unconditional mm -hmm. and when that happens all of the symptoms of imposter syndrome fall away so very interesting that's yeah so exciting very interesting because yeah you like you mentioned uh just a, a second ago you've got like a phd in engineering 
And from someone that's got a PhD in engineering to someone that's now kind of like specializing in this area of field of imposter syndrome, it's a bit of a, it's completely polar opposites, a bit like chalk and cheese in a, in a way. <laughs> um, and interesting enough, because I know that when we spoke offline, you said to me that you're working on a scientific paper, which we'll talk about, you know, during the show and stuff and uh, mm. what your findings are and, and so forth, so forth. So, uh, yeah, that's going to be quite fascinating. Interesting. Love it. Love it. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the common misperceptions around what what is imposter syndrome and what is not imposter syndrome, because I feel like I don't know about you, but certain trends that go around in the entrepreneurial world, right, whether it be imposter syndrome, whether it be artificial intelligence, whatever the trend is going on, right? Okay, people just use these fancy words, right, for the sake of using a fancy word. So I guess my uh, analogy is, is that, okay, great, yeah, they want to kind of like, I don't know, jump on the trend as such for whatever reason, whether it be to go viral or, you know, to, to, to make a name for themselves. But let's just talk a little bit about like the common misperceptions of of imposter syndrome. What is it and what is not imposter syndrome? Yeah, very good, very good starting point. So imposter syndrome is the secret feeling of being a fraud, like not good enough, yep. when you're not a fraud, right? So it's not lying on your resume. It's not deceiving people in interviews or, 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 or pretending to be something you're not. No, it's actually when you're successful, when you're powerfully achieving things, and at the same time, you don't feel like it's you. You don't feel like it's because you have this doubt and um, you can, it, it can either drag you down energy-wise or it can hold you back or, you know, it can cause you to hold yourself back. So that is imposter syndrome. It's a, it's a big deal. And as I said, it affects over 70% of high achievers. So um, Meryl Streep is a great example. Mm. So she is has more acting awards than any person on the planet. Right? She is a big. And yet at the beginning of every single movie that she makes, she has a feeling of why would anyone come and want to watch me? Why would anyone want to do that? Right. And that is imposter syndrome. So one of the myths about imposter syndrome is that it's a beginner's thing. It's when you don't know things, when you're not skilled and when, when you're still learning. And that's actually something entirely different. That's just, you know, unco uncomfortable. Learning is uncomfortable. Um, but it's not imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is when you are capable, you are competent, you have succeeded. And yet at the same time, you doubt yourself, you don't feel like you're good enough. You fear that someone will come and find you out at any moment. Got so it. It's, it's interesting you brought something up, which kind of caught my curiosity there. Because you said... <clears throat> Now I'm just thinking about. I don't. I don't suffer from uh, imposter syndrome, thank God. But for someone that does suffer from imposter syndrome, it is what you're saying. Is it because they maybe? Um, do you feel like when you are interacting with potential clients that suffer from this, is it because they're kind of living in the past, like where they say, for example, they are. I don't know at the beginning of their career or the beginning of their business, but they're super successful now, but they keep kind of wanting to kind of like live in the past and think, Oh, I'm just at the beginning stages. Is it similar to that too? Um, actually, actually it's not like the root, the root where this belief that drives imposter syndrome, the belief that our worth is conditional, where that comes from is a natural part of our childhood development that just yep. got skipped. So when we're between 18 months and three years old, we're learning our sense of who we are, our identity. And we learn that we are a separate being from other beings, a separate physical body from other physical objects and things like that. At that point, would have there been the time that we could have been educated that our worth does not depend on what we do, right? Our actions and our worth are separate. Mm -hmm. Most people, the vast majority, a whole society doesn't doesn't see that separation. So our 
uh, you know, we've got this merging together of our, of, of our worth and our actions. So that's where it all comes from. Then, so any beliefs that you've had or developed or experiences that you had since then would only serve to reinforce that belief. So it isn't even it, when somebody has imposter syndrome, it isn't even that they're thinking back to a difficult time, um, mm -hmm. you know, when they were first starting out or something like that. And you can mm -hmm. be in the most supportive, encouraging, nurturing environment, the most positive, upbeat workplace and still suffer from imposter syndrome. So oh. it's not so it's, a, it's an internal. Yes, there is. Yes, it can tr be triggered by a toxic work environment, mm -hmm. but it's not caused by a toxic work environment. Now, that's the that's a really important distinction because that mm -hmm. when you come to look at you know how to solve the the, the problem of imposter syndrome, mm -hmm. you know it, it's got to be looking inside, not outside. Interesting, interesting, interesting. So, okay, so in context of what you're saying, it's all associated with number one, your self worth. And your belief system about who you are as a person as well, and about kind of where you're at, where you want to achieve, but maybe you don't agree with it. And, and uh, do, do you also find that it also, is it because of external influences, uh, such as it could be the media, it could be that you create a belief system based around certain things where you may, I don't know, may see a certain role model and you, you may not there may be a complete mismatch or whatever. Does that make sense? Yeah. So one of the symptoms of imposter syndrome, because I'll, I'll go into what the symptoms are in a bit. Yes. One of them is comparing, comparing yes. yourself to others and comparing and seeing others, comparing yourself to, to how they look, how they appear to be and their success. And you compare it not to your appearance of success or your actual success but how you feel on the inside and if you've got that self-doubt on the inside then there just seems to be this huge gulf that makes you feel like you don't belong which reinforces imposter syndrome so that's <laughs> it's it's a it's a spiral it, it really is so you know the social media i gotta say it doesn't help but the comparing would be there anyway absolutely yep Agreed, yeah. especially for the younger generation as well. I mean, you've got a whole heaps of pressure of the whole society and stuff, but that's a whole new conversation around imposter yeah, syndrome. Yeah, we could talk for another hour on that one. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> true, true. Anyway, um, how does, I mean, say, for example, I mean, obviously, a lot of our listeners here are entrepreneurs and leaders, for example. How does... Um, imposter syndrome typically kind of manifest itself how does it show itself in mm. like a say an environment say a work environment as an example and what kind of the significant impacts it can have on that individual and the people around it and even kind of like from a professional personal growth perspective like what's the impact there too yeah, so there's a, there's a very long answer to that question. It's a very <laughs> so, long question, sorry. It's a very long question. Yeah, that's okay. <laughs> well, we can do it, though. We can do it. So there are there are three um, symptoms, types, categories of symptoms, if you like, with sure. imposter syndrome. There's the imposter syndrome thinking, and that's the self-doubt, the self-criticism, self-judgment, feeling like you don't belong, feeling like yep. you're isolated. So... The imposter syndrome thinking triggers your nervous system, right? It, it's basically your, 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 it stresses you out and then your nervous system responds. And your nervous system responds, and this is the second um, symptom, which is that you, you, have, you either go into fight, flight, or freeze states, the physiological stress states. You might have trouble sleeping. You might feel anxiety. You might feel overwhelmed. So these are very, very physical, physiological stresses. Sure. And so when you're stressed in that way, then the natural thing that your your whole system does is it wants to cope somehow. And so there are co it drives you to do coping behaviors. Now these are so these are imposter syndrome behaviors. This is the second group, the third group of symptoms. So okay. these behaviors are either hiding behaviors or striving behaviors. So the hiding behaviors are procrastinating, mm -hmm. um, not speaking up enough. Um, not not that you don't speak up, but maybe not enough. 
um, avoiding opportunities like a consultant would just not go for uh, certain jo uh, certain quotations putting forward because they feel they they wouldn't get it so they don't even try so it's a, so it's an avoiding thing um deflecting praise if someone says oh well done and it's like oh it's just good timing and oh i just got lucky <laughs> yeah <laughs> but genuinely believing that that's part of it so those are the hiding behaviors those are ones that are trying to the idea if you like is if i'm out of the spotlight people won't find out that i'm not as good as they think i am so then the it flips to the other one with the striving behaviors where um where you feel that you're not good enough, so now, now let's make yourself good enough. So it's this pushing forward kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So that's where people get perfectionism. Mm -hmm. That's where people are comparing. Um, Over-preparing is a very common one, spending, spending way more time and effort than is needed for a particular project, presentation, whatever. Um, and feeling, sometimes people feel like you don't have, they don't have quite enough qualifications when they do. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, if I only get another you know qualification mm. then i will start feeling better about myself and you know i i see executives spending two hundred thousand dollars on an ivy league um mba to try and fix this problem because they think mm. if once i have that maybe it'll prove to myself that i am good enough and it doesn't so it, it can, can get very frustrating so then these behaviors they're being driven by this stress and that they're unproductive, so they they cause you to lose focus. They um, they're distracting. You can't make such good decisions, um, and uh, you know that. And and it's very frustrating. And they don't seem to respond to any of the good habit change books you see out there. Let's let's change the habit. They don't respond. And the reason they don't respond is because they're driven by this stress. So then people judge themselves. Oh, it must be me. There must be something wrong with me. Maybe I can't. And that feeds into the imposter syndrome thinking. So you see, we've got this cycle going round and round with the imposter syndrome thinking, the stress, the behaviors, and, you know, judgment, stress, coping. Yeah. So that's imposter syndrome. And so many people try to combat it by tackling the symptoms that they see so they try mindset techniques to to talk themselves out of the, the the imposter syndrome thoughts well they don't work very well they try relaxation techniques to to calm the stress that helps somewhat but it still gets accelerated and they try as i said these habit change patterns to 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 change their behaviors and none of them really fix the issue because got two things you would need to tackle all three of those symptoms at once so they don't yeah. feed into each other um but better than that if you if you tackle the root cause you get rid of the root cause of it this belief that your worth is conditional then all of that falls away because all of that is only a response to that that belief that makes sense so, so you're it, so you're saying so you're saying thinking is the first one. Yeah. I know behavior was the third one. Sorry, I missed the second one. The second one is the physiological stress response. That's right, physiological yeah. stress. Yeah. So, cool. And 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 I have to say that this is all very logical, right? You know, this this isn't when people blame themselves, they feel it's irrational. They're being mm. over emotional. You know, it's illogical. No, there's real logic to every single step in this. So mm. it's a natural response to this belief that your worth is conditional. And it mm. typically shows up when people are, are in high pressure, high challenge environments. Not because there's anything specific about that environment, but it's where they're if they made a mistake, it would be significant, right? Mm. And so that's uh, that's 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 part of it. So it affects people mostly. We see it mostly in a professional capacity, and I deal with mm. you know leaders and executives um, exclusively. And the average age of them is forty five. Really interesting. Mm -hmm. mm. Very interesting. And I deal with it with people up to the sixties. So if people if people are in their twenties and and certainly their early thirties, there's an idea that well maybe it's because I'm a beginner, which mm. we said earlier it's, it's not. Um, or they think well maybe if I just push this through and I'll just get to the next 
whether it's a contract or it's a position, you know, then I'll start feeling better. And by the time they reach their 40s, 50s and 60s, they realize that it hasn't it hasn't changed it, right? That, that nothing's changed. It's a repeating pattern. And then it makes them start to blame themselves. And it leads to burnout, like particularly these striving behaviors, the over-preparing, the pushing through and, the, you know, the stress that goes with it. Um, it it, it, it causes people to burn out and burnout's a very serious thing it's not just oh I'm a little bit tired this weekend it, it's you know I, I've seen people you know bedridden for three months with it mm -hmm. it's it's mm -hmm. it's a serious blow and people end their careers they um mm -hmm. they they leave they quit their businesses they you know if they're mm -hmm. business owners they quit you know it's a it's a really big deal and and I would say that imposter syndrome is probably the biggest block to personal success and personal mm. performance interesting um, because of the impact and because of you know it affects so many people but all in different ways so you wouldn't yeah. have all of those symptoms you'd have your own unique profile of them yeah of course absolutely i guess for you when you i know that you've got a scorecard and stuff but is there also things how does personality profiling also make does that also help someone like you as a practitioner in terms of identifying some of the root causes of imposter syndrome and how to deal with them and how to speak and communicate to them that's a really good question now imposter syndrome was first identified back in 1978 so mm. that's quite a while ago now yeah 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 and um for um to a good 20 years of that People thought it was mostly a women's issue until yes. they made uh, everything. Um, they, they, someone did a study where the, the the survey was completely anonymous, and when it was that, then people, men and women came out equally. And certainly in my practice, I see no difference between men and women. What the other surveys were picking up is a cultural difference that we see globally, that it's less acceptable, or men aren't allowed to expose publicly what they consider to be a weakness it's more acceptable for a woman to do that than a man so that's what they were so we it, it turns out that it's not about gender at all um and then the other part of it you know there's a lot of academic research we're trying to tie it to personality types to personality profiles and the conclusion was that it's not to do with your personality type at all interesting yeah isn't that interesting the, the, the slightest thing was it's slightly people with imposter syndrome tend to be a little bit more conscientious and that's mm. about it so or maybe and, maybe a little bit introverted potentially as well not no not no, at all. really no, wow that's no, fascinating it's not introversion you can be absolutely you know full-on you know at the top of the range extrovert and still feel like at any moment someone's going to catch you out and you have to push through yeah so nothing to do introversion extroversion nothing to do with the personality mm. um profile and that backs up really this this idea that imposter syndrome is driven by a belief that we pick up when we're you know between two and three years old or, mm. or that we don't get educated out of it really mm. interesting yeah now in your i mean i, I know you've got two best-selling books um out which is congratulations by the way um <laughs> can you share like some of the kind of the key strategies that you've identified in some of the books um for helping people to i suppose overcome imposter syndrome are there a, is there a kind of a step-by-step -step guide or a methodology that you've kind of created for people if it was a kind of like a diy here is a here here go go away and do this and yeah yeah well the, the, so so my my first book unmasking which was was really for coaches to help coaches to help other people it works on focuses on calming the symptoms of imposter syndrome so you know we we know there's three types so let's calm the 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 thinking with some reframing let's calm the um, physiology with with personalized relaxation techniques and let's calm the um, imposter behaviors by you know putting plans together and and that really does kind of quiet things down um the way to get rid of imposter syndrome is to get rid of the belief that your worth is conditional so in my one-to-one -one work that's what i do and that's a very it's a very structured process you know we're we're 
people talk about you know coaching and, and, and therapy if you're going that deep but even deep coaching as as it always feels to them a bit wishy-washy you know yeah. you yeah. you you show up and I've and I've I've had loads and loads of you know my own experience and been the coach on the other side so you know I, I get it so you turn up and people say so what's going on for you today and the whole thing about the person-centered therapy and coaching is that you follow track where the person is at mm. and in certain coaches you know there's the, the coaching styles the person has their own answers so it's just of a case of let's just yeah now help helping that those them find those answers now with imposter syndrome the belief is unconscious so people aren't aware of it so no amount of exploration is going to pop this one up because they literally cannot see it They're, they'll they'll say oh was it because of like you, you said earlier was it maybe something in my past is it something in my environment because their brains are looking for what's causing the stress they can't see it so it's mm. unconscious so given that and given that we we know what that belief is um what i do in my work is i take people through a very structured process so first of all we look at we change the way that the brain views events that are stressful. This is essentially so we're working on, you know, back deep into neuroscience here. So I'm, <laughs> I don't know how deep you want me to go into this. If you want, I'll jump. jump go through. as deep as you. I'm fascinated. I, I mean, I mean, listen, I, I'm, I'm kind of actually distinct, trying to distinguish how important also self awareness is as part of this because I, I'm a, I'm a big fan of self self awareness because I think if you're not aware of what's going on how do you know how to how do you know you got a problem in the first place right <laughs> i mean that, that's kind of my analogy very 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 first step is well actually the very first step in my program is getting calm right mm. because when you are not calm when you're a, a stressed when your brain is not calm right it's looking out for danger it's always looking out for where's the next tiger snake you know fire <laughs> that's it right and in that mode that's not a that's not a brain changing mode. That's a defensive mode. So mm -hmm. first get calm. When you're mm -hmm. calm, then you can start to see things. So then you start with a um, awareness, um, self-awareness. One of the things I do actually is um, I do an emotional intelligence test before and after the, the program to, so we can actually track with the numbers again, you know, the engineering nice. come back to that, to track the, the, the progress. And there's a, there's generally a, significant improvement in emotional intelligence and a big part of emotional intelligence half of emotional intelligence is self-awareness so yes so that we are building self-awareness we're building in a framework of understanding the reasons why people do what they do mm -hmm. based on the belief of conditional words so now you've got a way of understanding people and their behaviors that sometimes seem so irrational right and so so un incomprehensible okay now we can understand it and we, it, and we really need to accept other people and then we get to learn to accept ourselves we do all that in the context of your own personal experiences so if i go right deep 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 so what's going on is there's a part of the brain called the amygdala which is the people talk about the fear center this is the bit that's looking out for danger and it's it. you know, behind in front of the ears behind the eyes there's two parts to it and um most of the brain once we're adults doesn't doesn't change only certain parts do change because the brain's model of the world is how we perceive the world is what keeps us safe right so we don't want to mess with <laughs> our, our, our painfully learned experiences but there are certain parts that will change and the amygdala is one of them because it needs to update if there's a new threat, if it's going to need a new threat. And what the amygdala mm -hmm. does is it works automatically. So it spots something, your brain spots something that resembles a previous threat and mm -hmm. it triggers your nervous system and it gets you ready to defend, protect yourself. So that's what the amygdala is doing. And it's looking out for instances that would reinforce your worth is conditional so what we do is we we change we go through a very specific pro process very specific that changes that um changes the neurochemicals so it releases something called acetylcholine 
right? There are three different ways to re um, release acetylcholine. And then in the presence of that, then the brain is able to change. So, you know, when you're getting down to the nuts and bolts of this, this looks very different to coaching, typical coaching, to talk therapy, you, mm -hmm. you know, anything like that, because we're, we're actually performing a process on mm -hmm. the brain that's, that's operating based on the way that the brain already works. So it's a very natural process. And what's most exciting for me about that is the, the, the results that it gets. So it gets, so for people who have, who do, who've done my program and, and they do all of it, right? Cause it's like a course of antibiotics. You've got to take the whole thing. You can't, you can't do a part and it won't go away. Um, no, you, once you take the whole thing, then it has a hundred percent success rate, which in engineering is just, you know, never happens. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, and, and in coaching, right. You know, in coaching and therapy, it, it, you know, it, it becomes unbelievable. But when you understand the process that's going on mm -hmm. then 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 of course it is and there is there is actually a very new form of therapy um that other people are doing that therapists are using with people with ptsd post-traumatic stress disorder along the same lines as this changing the acetylcholine around the amygdala that which changes the memory it's basically updates and reconsolidates it's called so reconsolidates changes the memories so that so that your amygdala no longer reacts to the stress. And that's why the symptoms fall away. Got because it. because you're no longer being triggered. So it's not like you're trying to align yourself, talk yourself into anything or anything like that. You know, your, your, your brain literally says, oh, no, actually, that's not a threat. So you would just stay relaxed. So it's like you're reprogramming yourself like a computer, really, in a nutshell, isn't it? It is, it is, but it, but it's not, and I do get asked this question, but it's not neuro linguistic programming. No, which is different. Yeah, this Absolutely. is, this is, um, um, I don't know, I don't know what you call it, bioengineering, but, it's, <laughs> <laughs> but, but it, it's, it's, it's a very, it's a very powerful process, and, um, mm -hmm. and it, and it, because it tracks the way that the brain learns what to fear, if you like, mm -hmm. and it undoes that then um, it's it's a hundred hundred percent success rate, which is which is just amazing. Very good. Yeah, and the then then the kind of results that you get. Well, then you know you pe people forget to doubt themselves. So you're talking about the imposter syndrome thinking. People forget to doubt themselves. So when they're thinking about oh we've been invited to give this talk or that you know this award ceremony or you know this 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 big speech to a whole bunch of your you know very very smart peers, right? Then it's like, oh, would I like to do that? Oh, would I, you know, you, you weigh up the pros and cons, not the, oh my gosh, I couldn't do that because I don't, I, you know, and what would they think? You just don't go there. So sure. it, it creates an effortless confidence. It's not an overconfidence, you know. Um, it's not that you'll stop evaluating things, right? You, you're not going to stop reflecting which is what some people fear when you when you talk about well let's let's get rid of your self doubt people say well self doubt is good well no self doubt is not good self reflection and self awareness those are all very good but self doubt is self reject self reflection plus judgment i yes. just don't need that judgment no agreed very good like that i know that um we we we're, we're coming towards the end of our conversation but there is something that um well there's a couple of things actually the first thing is when as a coach in doing what you're doing and stuff, mm. what are some of the, I mean, maybe, I don't know, there are kind of some questions that maybe some of our listeners could go away with and start to, you know, question our subconscious mind because effectively, I'm not saying that this is something that we could go off and reprogram our minds to, you know, to cure imposter syndrome. That's not what I'm saying, but I guess, are there any questions that, or maybe there is uh, some homework that you give, give, say, clients that you, say, did sessions with or whatever it is, and you might say to them, I want you to go away and work on this, okay? And these are the things I want you to go and ask your subconscious. Is there anything kind of springs to mind that helps them to kind of, you know, accelerate that process of overcoming imposter syndrome? 
Um, well, the, the, the process that we work through does that. And, yes. and, 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 the, and the structure of it is, you know, homework and, you know, exercise you do yourself and then one-to-one sessions, right? So, so, so that's the process. But I think coming back to what you said earlier about self-awareness, that's, that's the best place to start, right? Yes. Do you have any of the imposter syndrome thinking that I was talking about? And, you know, maybe your listeners can, you know, wind back and, and, and listen to all of those again. You know, does that, does that resonate? Does this sound like imposter syndrome? Because once you know that this is imposter syndrome, it does, it does several things. It tells you that it's not you right this isn't your personality this isn't who you are um and and you're not alone in this right and so you feel less of that isolation so those really help and then the third part is and there is something that you can do about it you can get rid of this for good you can manage it calm it down a bit Mm. or you can get rid of it for good and then that just that is helpful right just no just 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 knowing that um very good yeah like that i mean self-awareness you know i'm a big fan of it and i think i i I kind of begin to agree with you on that you know if you're becoming more aware of who you are as a person and 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 things like that then you can help yourself well to a certain point and a certain degree and then they you know what i mean so I, i think it's great um i know that we were speaking offline about um a science paper that you're working on or some a key piece of research that you're working on Give us some context about why you're doing it and what do you want to prove? Like what, what's the, what's the, tell us a little bit more about the research. What do you want to prove? And you know, what, it, what are you hoping? How would you, where do you believe this piece of research? How, what are you hoping to do with it? Are you hoping to get it into the hands of someone? Give us some context around the science paper. Okay, great. Yes. Thank you for asking. <laughs> so, in 20 so bear in mind imposter syndrome research started in 1978 which yes is what's that it's about 40 or 40, 45 years ago something like that exactly yeah 45 years ago yeah 45 years ago 45 years of research right in 2020 the universe one of the universities did this huge study they looked at all of the imposter syndrome research there's a meta study they call it where they look at um you know what the prevalence of it you know the predictions who might show up you know we we're talking about personality and stuff and and the um uh, and, and and interventions for it you know what how what people can do and what they said and bear in mind this is 2020 they said that there was no published evaluation of a methodology to sort out imposter syndrome. Mm. Right? So it's not surprising that there's a whole bunch of, we talked about a few of the myths about imposter syndrome, what it is, what it isn't. We, there's, a whole, there's this vacuum because there's been no proven way to, to deal with it. Now, a paper published just this year was from a study with um, uh, college students and it was building self-compassion and uh, they were they were taking they were measuring the 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 stress of imposter syndrome one of the behaviors perfectionism before and after this this program that they did for these students and they found it it, that, that it took them from eight out of ten like so if your stress maximum stress was ten before the the program they were scoring eight ish and then after the program they were scoring six ish Mm. this is a numerical thing and that prompted me i thought you know what my program's getting really good results let me look at the last couple of years and let's get my own data and my data showed that the average stress beforehand uh, of of all of these symptoms was 8.3 out of 10 and after the average was 2.9 so that is a huge drop and i i see it you know it's it's massively transformation i say the, the symptoms fall away it it does people feel lighter they feel calmer they feel relaxed they feel energized they you know, they feel massively better so that's all just words but now i've got the numbers 8.3 down to 2.9 And in the context that the academic world does not have, you know, a a recognized, established way to to deal with imposter syndrome, I thought I 
it can't just be the book. I have to get a paper out there as well. And that's my motivation for sharing it. Um, and um, it's very exciting because, you know, for the first time we have we have something that that actually works. So I mean, I've been pottering on working one to one with people. Now, OK, let's step back the big picture. Actually, this is really significant and a lot more people should do this. So, mm. you know, I have got a. Um, an, uh, an accredited ICF accredited coaching course that I run to teach other coaches how to do this process with other people. So um, my goal is to spread this information that there is a solution that you don't have to put up with. It is unnecessary suffering. And, you know, taking it right back to the impact, the, the, the stress that it causes at the highest levels is going to affect individual businesses and as a group, the whole economy, right? You know, quality of decisions, um, energy levels, you know, if, you, if you're exhausted and tired, you're not thinking so well. If you're stressed, you're not thinking so well. If you're distracted, you're not focused, you make mistakes. You, you know, imposter syndrome has massive impact on performance. And so, you know, it needs the solution needs to be out there and put out there, not just for people to, you know, work it one to one, but for, co for other people to coaches to to um, to work and, and spread this. Very good. Love it. Some good stuff there. Well, this has uh, been well, it's been very enlightening listening talking about imposter syndrome, because I mean, what, what's really interesting about our conversations, because I mean, you're very scientific in your approach, but also you're very practical in your approach. And I think that it, it, it that comes across to me in a very, uh, it, it makes it very obvious to me that, uh, you, you know, you're on, you're on this big mission, should we say. And, uh, yeah. and I like that. That is, it's, it's really good. I, I, I do like, because people, I suppose for it to be recognized, as you said, as you said, but in order for something like this to be recognized, you've got to have the academic versus the practicality side of stuff, haven't you? So, you know, love it. Yeah. Some good stuff. You, you need you need the theory. You know, I I I had actually started putting together the parts to this program before mm. I had done the neuroscience research that explained it. Yes. Once I found the neuroscience processes and research that explained it. Now it's more solid. Now it's believable. Now it's understandable. Okay, why are we getting such good results? Well, here's here's all the research to show why this works. This is the way the brain works. We're working exactly with the way the brain works, and and for me that that just that that coherence, that consistency, it it, it feels it feels rock solid. Then and it's it's dependable. And, very good. Love it. And for you guys that are listening in, I hope that you've been uh, enjoying our conversations with me and Tara. And what I was going to say to you, I know that there are, um, if you have any further questions around imposter syndrome, of course, feel free to reach out to her and her social media links are below, of course. And there's a couple of free gifts as well that you can tap into. And uh, uh, I know that uh, Tara's kindly provided her scorecard where you can take the quiz and learn more about uh, in, if you've got imposter syndrome because again self-awareness right super important mm -hmm. okay so kind of putting that on your radar um, is going to be extremely important first of all uh, Tara I just want to say thank you so much for being on the show it's been a, it's been a, it's been a jam yeah I loved it it's great thank you Adam <laughs> You're welcome. So for you guys, I hope you've enjoyed today's show. Please do me a favor, as I said at the beginning, if you have enjoyed today's conversations, please go over to Apple or on Spotify. Leave her a one or, one or a five-star review over there. We'd greatly appreciate that. Anyway, from me and Tara, thank you so much. And uh, hopefully we'll see you guys again on uh, listening on the next podcast. Take care and we'll see you then. Cheers. <laughs>